Let us pray. Spirit, this morning we ask that you would graft us into a life deeper than we know. That you would work in our hearts and bring us to a fullness that right now seems impossible. We pray this in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I suspect it was probably also true of you. My mind and heart were overwhelmed this week. Everything feels right now so big and so massive, and that's because it is so big and massive. Over 100,000 Americans have died from COVID-19, and, and somehow we still can't decide as a culture how big a deal this is for us. Black America is crying out for justice. White America is waking up to injustice in new ways. And I wept as I watched tear gas flow in downtown Colorado Springs last night. And we're just getting started with the presidential election. The common thread that is running through all of this is that we are fracturing. We are splintering and we don't know how to put us back together again. So this week, I was asking myself the question, what would be good news right now? What would be balm for these wounds? What truth might be strong enough to weave us back together? Is there even a truth that strong? There is, church. A million times, yes, there is. The Trinity is strong enough. Now, I fully understand that the Trinity might not sound like good news to you. It may feel like a dry, boring, inane theological rambling that involves in the, that belongs in some back corner of a library. But when John talks about the Trinity, the words he uses are the ones that our souls are hungry for. Listen again to that New Testament reading from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Life, joy, fellowship, touch, see, feel. Those are words that my heart aches for right now. And those are words that John's readers were aching for. John was writing in the late first century to a culture that was soaked in death, riven with oppression, beset by racial divisions. Even the fledgling church was breaking apart because of disagreements. Suspicion of one another was rampant. Sacrificial love was giving way to self-protection. And doubt that any of this is actually true at all was growing. So the Apostle John writes them a letter. A letter about the life of the Trinity. And about how we are invited into that life. And about how we live out that life day to day in the nitty gritty. Because he knew that that is the only story big enough to heal all the wounds that have been torn open. Any other story is only going to get to the symptoms. This one gets to the disease. Because this story, John says, is from the beginning, from before the beginning. This story is about life as it's meant to be and how it will one day be again. But it's a story not of uniformity or conquest. In this story, diversity is built in from the beginning. The Word of God, also called the Son of God, dwells with the Father and the Spirit, although John will get to that later. 
They're not identical. All three are distinct persons with distinct roles, but that diversity is held in a complete unity, in a relationship of love and delight, of deepest appreciation with one another in the midst of their distinctions. And what emerges in that unity in the midst of diversity is a life so deep and so abundant that it can only be called eternal. It's life that is eternally welcoming, eternally glorifying, eternally valuing, eternally giving. That kind of life is not just a pipe dream. It is the foundation of all reality. It is the pulsating heartbeat that put the universe into being. And it's a dream planted deep in our hearts because we are made in the image of this triune God, this God who is unity in diversity. If this is all just natural forces colliding off one another, then this is weak versus strong, might versus right. The strongest one wins. But if we are made in the image of the triune God, this unity in diversity, this love is what we will hunger for. And we will try to fill that hunger with junk food. And we have, again and again, splintering off into smaller groups and setting ourselves against them, whoever they are. Setting ourselves even against God, whoever he is. We make our love dependent on rejection of others. But that is less than communion. That is less than unity. That is less than love. That is less than what we were made for. That is less than the Trinity itself and what he desires for us. That is why the Son, the Word of Life, came. Came with brown skin into a marginalized culture, into a religion rife with division with a broken body and a fragile breath. And he invaded the division, the distance, the fear, the hatred, the separation, and anchored himself on the suffering side of it. He united himself to us and to our mess. He came close enough for us to touch and hear and feel. Because God is not content with holding us at a distance. And he did not come near so that he might punish us. So that he might hold us down. He came all the way to us so that we might come all the way to him. That is why John uses this word fellowship over and over again in this passage. Fellowship is what we're aiming for. Fellowship is the goal. Fellowship doesn't mean finger foods and small talk. Fellowship is from the Greek word koinonia. It means communion, participation, sharing, uniting, unity, in diversity. It means shalom, and not just the absence of hostilities, but the presence of abundance and delight and love, the healing of what has been fractured, the weaving of what has been rent. Because Jesus came in the flesh all the way to us, John says, we can have koinonia with the Son. And because we have koinonia with the Son, we also have koinonia with the Father. We are grafted into their relationship of life and love in the midst of diversity. Their delight and difference, their unity is robust enough to graft even us in. And then he goes on to say throughout this letter that when we have koinonia with the Father and the Son, that spills over into koinonia with one another. We cannot be united to Christ and ignore the concerns of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We cannot claim to have been brought close to Jesus and stand far off from those he has made and is remaking. This is the gospel logic. This is how all this fraying is going to be rewoven. This is how the splinters will be put back together. The triune God is inviting us into his unity and putting us at unity with one another. He is not only the foundation of the cosmos, he is now the invitation to the cosmos into a new kind of life. And by sending his spirit, he grafts us in. 
That's what the Spirit has always done, what he was doing on Pentecost. On this day, we remember that people from different nations and languages all around the Mediterranean heard the good news that this Jesus had come from the Father in the flesh and now had gone back to his Father, and they were now invited into that life together, into a life so full that it could only be called eternal. And God, being who God is, made sure that they heard that invitation in their own languages, in their native tongues, because this is what the Son did. This is what the Spirit does. He comes to us. He chases us down. He grabs us by the scruff of the neck, and He brings us into His unity. The only cost of entry is the awareness that we need to be forgiven for the ways we cause division. The only cost of entry is our repentance into living a new kind of life. See, this is always what it looks like when the Spirit shows up. Sometimes miracles, always confession. Sometimes wonders, always repentance. When we ask, come Holy Spirit, that is what we are asking for. It's a dangerous prayer, and we are praying it today. Because right in the midst of this chaos and turmoil, right in the midst of these racial, political, public health, marital, relational divisions, right in the places where we are fractured and splintered, right where we are tempted to say, us versus them, the Spirit comes and says, confess, repent, enter in. Confess of the ways that we resist unity. Repent of the ways that we have been content with the splintering. Receive this life that spills over from the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then after we have received it, release it. Proclaim it. Shout it from the rooftops. This is what John says. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. And we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. This God is the hope of the world. This story is the only one big enough to heal our divisions. Friends, there are a lot of important things. But your thoughts on the First Amendment are not going to heal us. Your hot takes on the rioting are not going to rescue anyone. Masks are not going to save the world or tear it down. I honestly don't give a flip whether you prefer Democrats or Republicans. I care about whether your eyes are set on the prize. Whether your heart and mind and soul are anchored in the God who holds all things together and is bringing all things back together. Are you speaking the news that is truly good enough to heal what is broken? that is powerful enough to bring the shalom that we are crying out for. The world is tearing at the seams. But we know the God who is knit together in himself, who knits us together with himself. That koinonia is what we are waiting for, what we are longing for, and what we should be fighting for. Don't settle for trying to win skirmishes around the edges of the news cycle. Those are going to fade. Our God will win the war and bring shalom. And he is inviting you to be a part of that. Be a part of healing the disease. Not just covering over the symptoms. Welcome the world into the eternal life of the Trinity. Let us pray. Father, we long for more than what we have. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and to fill to move and to stir, to shake and to rattle and to reset to the bones that are broken. We ask that you would come and bring us to confession and repentance. That you would free us 
from getting stuck in these dead ends of us versus them and lead us to the fullness of life in you. Amen.